July the 16th, 1945, Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. The atomic age is born. This is the story of one forgotten child of the early optimistic days of atomic power. How, before the space race of the 1960s, America and Russia poured billions into another technological contest. The building of a giant nuclear-powered aircraft. A plane so fantastic it could stay aloft for months at a time. Free of earthbound and vulnerable bases, it was the ultimate doomsday machine. Today, atomic energy is mistrusted, even feared. But for a time, just after World War II, things were different. The American public was gripped by a happy nucleomania. There would soon be electricity too cheap to meter. There would be atomic-powered cars, trains, helicopters and cargo ships. Well, the public perception about nuclear power uh right after the war and uh, for probably 20 years thereafter, was very positive. People talked about it coming very soon, and they talked about power too cheap to meter and other, other optimistic remarks like that. Some people talked about using it everywhere, you know, for transportation of all kinds. There was even a scheme, I mean, totally mad from today's perspective, to detonate atomic bombs over the North and South Pole to melt the ice, give the world a warmer climate. And there would be atomic-powered airplanes. As early as 1942, Enrico Fermi and his associates on the Manhattan Project, which built the first atom bomb, had discussed the prospective use of atomic power to propel aircraft. The great advantage nuclear power could give a plane was an almost limitless range. In 1950, in-flight refueling had not yet been perfected, although experiments by the British in the interwar years had shown that the technology to transfer fuel between two planes in flight was easy enough to perfect. But in the pre-jet age, carrying aloft a worthwhile load of gasoline to transfer to another aircraft meant the project was impractical. Now, the British had actually done some uh, limited experiments in in-flight in refueling before the war, but what they'd found was that you could not transfer significant amount of fuel to make uh, a real difference in the range. World War II was fought without in-flight refueling. US B-17s and B-24s operating over Germany were massacred because fighter escorts, with their short range, could not fly with them. Only when fighters like the Mustang became available, specially equipped with long-range fuel tanks, could daylight bombing raids be carried out over Nazi Germany without huge losses. The operating range of aircraft was a major and continuing concern to the American military. In 1937, the Army Air Corps commissioned the Lockheed P-38 Lightning as a long-range fighter interceptor to operate mainly over the Pacific. When it entered service in 1941, the P-38 had a range of 700 kilometers. America had to fight wars like no one else. They had to fight over the Pacific. That meant it needed aircraft with immense range. They also had to fly safely. A single-engine fighter was at risk. If the engine stopped, the plane went down into the sea. You needed two engines. So that meant an airplane, fast, safe, twin-engined, that was the P-38. In 1944, the Army Air Force introduced the B-29 Superfortress, an aircraft with a range of four and a half thousand kilometers, capable of bombing Japan from island bases in the Central Pacific. World War II also saw the development of technology which would solve some of the problems that had hindered American pre-war civil aviation. Bigger and more efficient engines and airframes would allow civil airliners, for the first time, to traverse the oceans without stopping to refuel. In 
All these developments seemed to usher in a new age of opportunity in which everything was possible. Yet these developments were dwarfed by an entirely new set of problems and challenges. The Cold War, although only just beginning, was set to dominate American strategic thinking for decades to come. America needed a bomber to reach targets deep inside Soviet Russia. A bomber with a range of tens of thousands of kilometers. The answer lay with a radical new kind of engine. In 1946, under the leadership of General Curtis LeMay, the United States Air Force set up a program called NEPA, which stands for the N Nuclear Energy Propulsion of Aircraft. This was to oversee the possibilities of designing and building a bomber that would be a nuclear-powered bomber. Just as the P-38 and the B-29 had provided the means with which to confront Japan in the Pacific, a nuclear-powered bomber seemed to be the ideal aircraft for any future conflict with Russia. The number one advantage, and really any other advantages derived from it, was the fact that they imagined that the flight duration could be greatly extended, almost indefinitely. Within a year, design work had begun on one of the most awesome weapons platforms ever proposed, an atomic bomber. In 1948, the head of the newly created Strategic Air Command was General Curtis E. LeMay. He had commanded the B-29 offensive against Japan in the Pacific. LeMay had a reputation as a confrontationist, what we might today call a hawk. Well, he was a general who really didn't particularly care for civilians. <laughs> he was a fighting general from World War II. He had commanded uh, bombing attacks in both Europe and in Japan. So he was a World War general with the kind of attitudes you would expect in a successful general from that period. Now, LeMay sought the ultimate bomber to counter the new Soviet threat, one powered by nuclear engines and capable of remaining airborne indefinitely. This would be America's principal weapon in any future world war. In military terms, and uh, setting it in, in the right historical context, this was a great idea because what it meant was that you could build a bomber that was not constrained by the amount of fuel it carried. So you could have a nuclear bomber, nuclear powered, carrying nuclear weapons, airborne, all the time, watching and waiting for the enemy. But LeMay and the Air Force were not trusted by someone in high office, President Harry Truman. President Truman was very worried about leaving this awesome power of the atom solely in the hands of the military. So he created a civilian body, the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC, uh, responsible directly to himself and the office of the president. And this would control all nuclear research, it would control the nuclear reactors, and, and this really annoyed the generals, it would keep under lock and key the atomic bombs. The Atomic Energy Commission identified a series of uses for an atom-powered aircraft. First, as a long-range bomber, Power from a nuclear reactor would theoretically allow an aircraft to fly for months without refueling, using only tiny amounts of uranium. Another possibility was the flying boat. The Atomic Energy Commission's pet team of academics at MIT thought that one of the prime candidates for a nuclear-powered aircraft was a passenger flying boat. Uh, in those days, Air traffic was still very underdeveloped. There weren't that many big airfields could take passenger planes. So flying port to port was quite a good idea. Also, an atomic reactor in an aircraft was quite heavy, and a flying boat was big enough to carry it. So that looked like a good bet. Indeed, before the age of the jet, the flying boat seemed the most promising aircraft for long-haul civil aviation. The design also allowed for more passengers to be carried in a greater degree of comfort. Millionaire Howard Hughes built the Spruce Goose to carry passengers across the Atlantic non-stop. And in England, 
Saunders Row were building the elegant Princess flying boat. It was intended for the growing transatlantic market. They were developing a docking system. Uh, in fact, that was in use at Southampton, so you no longer were taken out to your flying boat in, in, your, in motorboats. You'd climb, walked aboard it from docks, and there would have been docks at either end, drive the aeroplane in, tie it up, and then walk ashore. The Princess was one of the largest aircraft ever built. Well, it was a double-decker, so we had upper and lower decks. We had provision for cocktail bars and all the rest of it, and double berth cabins. It was definitely going to be an upmarket luxury way of crossing the Atlantic in about seven and a half hours. An atom-powered flying boat might have other uses. Atomic power was also being developed for a new generation of submarines that could lurk for months under the sea. New flying boats with atomic engines would have the range to hunt them down. September 1949. A lone US B-29 reconnaissance bomber picks up samples of radioactive material high above the Soviet Union. Russia had joined the nuclear club. The next year, North Korea invaded South Korea. The Cold War had turned hot. These events were to accelerate the plan for an American atom-powered bomber. The Congressional Joint Committee on Atomic Energy was very, was very much in favor of going ahead with promoting and going ahead with the nuclear bomber. The Atomic Energy Commission itself also was. They, they developed eventually a special subdivision which did that work. And uh, within the Department of Defense, the Department of the Air Force, there, was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of great hopes for the nuclear airplane. In 1951, the Atomic Energy Commission ordered into production the world's first experimental nuclear-powered aircraft. The designated aim, uh, as stated in 1951, was to produce two flying test beds, so two flying nuclear-powered aircraft by 1957. And the programme started with a series of testing the shielding requirements for the crew. The major issue was how to protect the pilot and crew from the effects of radiation coming from the reactor. One solution that was seriously canvassed uh, was only using older crew to fly the aircraft. The theory being that uh, they would be irradiated to some degree anyway, uh, but if they were beyond child-rearing age, uh, then um, it wouldn't matter so much. You, you had to use all these tricks, like base it on un uninhabited islands and things like that. Use old men for the pilots so that, so that the effect of radiation on the gene, on, you know, on, the, on the sperm would not get into children. They were gonna have, have Pilots they called him the Nipah Man. To gain experience in dealing with radiation shielding, it was decided to build a flying reactor before the atomic engines were ready. Well, they were talking about special aircraft because nobody knew how much it was going to weigh, but it looked like it was going to weigh an awful lot. So the US Air Force turned to its biggest aircraft, the mighty Convair B-36 bomber. The B-36 was the largest American bomber ever built. It had a wingspan of 70 meters and a range of 13,000 kilometers. At first, the B-36 was powered by six conventional propeller engines, but later versions saw the addition of four jet engines for greater speed and load carrying, giving rise to the phrase, six turning, four burning. Aircrew called it the aluminium overcoat. The B-36, for the first time, gave the American Air Force the capacity of what we now call global reach, global power. That is that you can reach anywhere in the world with a bomber and influence events there through bombing them. In 1953, an ordinary B-36 bomber was selected as a test bed for the atomic bomber program. It was modified to carry a small reactor in the aft bomb bay. The reactor was not connected to the engines. A new nose section housed a 12-ton lead and rubber shielded compartment for the crew of five, pilot, co-pilot, 
flight engineer, and two nuclear engineers. There were also water jackets in the fuselage and behind the crew compartment to absorb radiation from the reactor. After conversion, the aircraft was redesignated the NB-36, the N standing for nuclear. What they did was they took an actual working nuclear reactor and they put it in the aft bomb bay and they flew with it. And the point being, could you protect the crew from the radiation from a working reactor? The whole essence of this experiment was simply to test whether you could fly a nuclear reactor in an aircraft and not kill the crew through radiation while doing it. If you couldn't solve that problem, then it didn't matter whether you could make the engines work, no one would fly it. The first flight of the NB-36 with its atomic reactor was on September the 17th, 1955. The pilots christened their aircraft the Crusader. The tests proved that the radiation could be contained, provided there was heavy shielding. Atomic-powered flight was a step closer. But now, another problem had to be resolved. It was all very well flying with a reactor, but what happened if you crashed? Because of this danger, the Air Force took very special precautions. Flying beside the NB-36 on every mission was an Air Force transport plane carrying a platoon of Marines. The plan was that if ever the NB-36 crashed, the Marines in the accompanying aircraft would instantly parachute out, seal off the crash site from uh, prying eyes, uh, and obviously to protect uh, any, any nosy civilians. Uh, that could have been quite dangerous, and, and the Marines being the Marines, they nicknamed the, this, this unit the Glow-in-the-Dark Brigade. Between 1955 and 1957, the NB-36 made 47 successful flights. The problem now was to get an actual working aircraft into the air. And the division of labor was that the Air Force would provide the airframe and the Atomic Energy Commission would provide the working engine. The planned propulsion system would weigh 80 tons. The whole nuclear engine unit, including the reactor, was to be built as a single module and removable for refueling and repair. The challenge now was to get an atom-powered engine to work in flight. An ordinary jet engine works by sucking in air through an intake and compressing it. This means that more of the oxygen required to burn the fuel is squeezed into the combustion chamber. The aviation fuel then burns with the oxygen, causing continuous rapid heating of the air. This heated air expands rapidly, creating thrust to propel the aircraft forward. A jet engine can attain great speed. However, there is a drawback. A fast jet engine is fuel hungry, yet the aircraft can carry only so much aviation fuel. That is why modern military jets are so dependent on in-flight refueling. But an atomic motor would solve this problem. The fuel oxygen combustion process is replaced with the heat from the reactor, which lasts for months or years at a time. The theory of an atomic engine is very simple. In fact, it's simpler than a jet engine. You simply take the air and you put it into the reactor, which suddenly heats it up. It's not even a chemical reaction. The air just expands, pops out the other end and pushes the plane forward. The theory was simple, but the engineering was not. The scientists at the Atomic Energy Commission came up with two competing ways to build an atomic jet engine. There were two main approaches to nuclear aircraft propulsion. One of them involved reactors that simply had longitudinal holes and the air passed, the air came in one end cold, passed through fine holes inside the reactor, became very strongly heated and produced thrust coming out the other end. Well, the advantage of direct power is that it's simpler. The, the, there are almost no moving parts. The, the air goes into the reactor, passes through a lot of little holes through the reactor, comes out hot. So in principle, it's simpler. 
But this so-called direct cycle engine proved to have a major drawback. The downside to the direct cycle method is that it's very easy for the air passing through the reactor core to become irradiated, either directly if the shielding is weak or if in the course of time with the, the heat and dynamic pressures uh, the, 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 the shielding begins to break down and the irradiated materials begin to flow out of the reactor core, in which case you are spewing dirty material at the back of the aircraft. That led the Atomic Energy Commission scientists to propose a second kind of atomic motor called the indirect cycle. The other approach was to have a reactor separate from the propulsion system, but on the airplane, of course, which would produce lots of, lots of energy, heat. Then that energy would be transferred from the reactor to a propulsion unit, a jet-like propulsion unit, through the use of, uh, of hot liquid metals. The indirect cycle has the advantage that you avoid passing the air through the reactor. Therefore, you're going to avoid the problem of any irradiated materials exiting the plane. So what you have to do is to have some medium between the air and the hot reactor, some other substance that will pass from the hot reactor taking heat and transfer it to the air. But that means a lot of plumbing, and it's very heavy, and that's difficult for an aircraft. There were now two competing atomic motors, the simple but more dangerous direct system and the safer but complex and heavier indirect system. In the race to build the first atomic engine, the General Electric Company opted for the direct cycle, the, the simpler though potentially dirty system. The Pratt & Whitney Company opted for the indirect cycle, safer but more complex to engineer. While testing of the NB36 continued and work on the nuclear engines got underway, General LeMay and the Air Force drew up plans for a real atomic bomber. Two, one, zero. In the 1950s, the new technology of ballistic missiles was still in its development phase. Rockets were not yet reliably accurate. And there was also an aversion towards the pilots of the 50s becoming the so-called silo-sitters of the 60s. Many people within the Air Force, especially the older experienced people, uh, simply favored airplanes over missiles, and the nuclear airplanes seemed like, you know, in that sense, it was a godsend. The big advantage that people saw for nuclear-powered aircraft was simply that the flight duration could be extended indefinitely. That meant the range could be any, anything you wanted. It means they could stand on station if they were for defensive or observational purposes. The new atomic-powered bomber would look very different from its predecessors. It was called the WS-125. Design and construction of the aircraft was entrusted to Convair, builders of the B-36. The Air Force developed a lot of formal administrative techniques and one was to classify programs, and, and WS just stands for weapon system, and uh, they all had numbers, and the WS-125 was a nuclear airplane. The plan was for the WS-125 to be operational in the early 1960s. It was never given a B for bomber number, but could have been the B-72. The WS-125 would have a reactor situated in the main body of the aircraft, feeding two jet engines. It would carry atomic bombs or cruise missiles. The crew would be in a shielded front cockpit. Operationally, the WS-125's mission then would be to stand off uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, hanging around the Arctic Circle for days, if not weeks on end, ready to dash in and hit Soviet cities. This nuclear-powered air fleet would be limited only by the endurance of its flight crews. While work continued on the nuclear engines, the NB-36 testbed grappled with another problem, shielding the crew from radiation. The normal lead shielding used in atomic power plants was going to be too heavy to put in an aircraft. It would slow the plane down making it vulnerable to fighter attack. The answer was distributed shielding, or shadow shielding. 
instead of having all the shielding in one place, you might have some of it around the reactor, but you might also have some around the pilots. In an earthbound reactor, you simply surround the reactor with, with lead, which slows down the, the various uh, nuclear particles that are flying off. Can't do that in, a, in an aircraft because you need lightweight shielding. So what they decided to do was to sort out the different kinds of atomic particles that would be loosed off from the reactor, discover different kinds of shielding, uh, lightweight shielding that would block each, and distribute around the aircraft these different kinds of shielding. Keeping the weight of the aircraft within manageable proportions now became the overriding priority of the project. The ANP continued to focus on the key problem, which was getting the weight of the whole system down. They did this in two ways. One was the divided shield concept, where they were continually trying different tweaks and different materials uh, in order to improve the efficiency of that. The second way they looked at was decreasing the reactor size. Uh, the only problem with decreasing reactor size is that in order to keep the performance the same, you have to increase the temperature so that you end up with the same amount of thrust produced by the smaller engine. But progress on all fronts, engine, shielding, reactor power, was slow. And the atomic bomber now had a rival. The US Navy, always jealous of the Air Force, had started its own atom-powered plane project. What the Navy did is it went back to the idea of the original MIT team of the 1940s who talked about flying boats. So the Navy decided an atomic-powered flying boat would be a very good idea. It, it would be peculiar if nobody in the Navy thought about using a nuclear reactor for a flying boat, as long as the Air Force is thinking about it for something else. The Navy wanted a nuclear-powered version of the Martin Seamaster, the world's first jet-powered seaplane. But to defeat its Air Force rival, the US Navy also sought British aid. The British already had a giant flying boat capable of carrying the weight of a nuclear reactor, the Saunders Row Princess. The US Navy Bureau asked Saunders Row to provide a, a brochure study of putting a nuclear power unit into the, into the Princess flyboat for use by the US Navy. And I seem to remember a sum of $50,000 being paid to us to do the work, and we, which we did and delivered not only a brochure but an, a model of the airplane. Dick Stratton was in charge of flight testing the Princess. The main thing was to install um, a nuclear reactor in the upper deck, which would feed hot gases to the inboard power plants. And the aircraft would take off on turbine fuel, and when it was up and away, they would then switch off the turbines and go over to the nuclear-powered turbines on the big inboard engines. And of course, it would stay up for as long as you wanted it to stay up. But the US Navy quickly abandoned nuclear-powered flying boats in favor of another nuclear-powered weapon system, the atomic submarine. The great advantage of the nuclear-powered sub was that you could use the heavy lead shielding in the submarine. Weight was not a problem. And therefore, you could also carry a much bigger reactor. And you could shield the crews uh, of the nuclear submarine so it, like the uh, proposed nuclear bomber, could sit undetected, underwater, off the coast of uh, the United States even to fire its missiles, or off the coast of Russia to fire shorter range missiles, or indeed almost anywhere in the world to provide that independent and safe nuclear deterrent. The two projects, the Air Force's atom-powered plane and the Navy's atomic subs, were now deadly rivals. One of the inspirations the Air Force had for building a nuclear airplane was that the Navy had a nuclear submarine and they weren't about to be left out in this uh, high-tech propulsion area. But the reality was that the atomic bomber program was in crisis. In 1956 there was some good news and some bad news for the atomic powered project. Um, General Electric Company at last managed to get uh, a nuclear powered jet engine prototype working. Uh, but the bad side was that uh, the thrust produced was nowhere near enough to lift the whole system off the ground. The Air Force and General Electric now sought more money for the atomic bomber program. But they were to run up against an unexpected obstacle. 
President Dwight D. Eisenhower. President Eisenhower, as a military man, was very suspicious of the, of the military industrial complex and always suspected that, that these kind of companies were pushing projects too far and too fast just in order to gain big contracts. His Deputy Defence Secretary then ordered a stop to the, uh, to the X6 and WS125 programmes in the view that they were just far too ambitious. And I think that was a realistic assessment. So he ordered those programmes stopped and ordered the agency to concentrate on trying to get the engine right. As a result, the NB36 flying reactor made its last flight on March the 28th, 1957. It was decommissioned at Fort Worth in late 1957. It was scrapped several months later, with the radioactive parts being buried. It looked like the atom-powered aircraft project was grounded. But then, on December the 1st, 1958, Aviation Week magazine, America's most authoritative defense journal, splashed an amazing story. The Soviet Union had flown an atomic-powered bomber. They had a picture of it. I was, uh, it was just an artist's conception, but it was a nuclear-propelled airplane. A four-engine delta-wing nuclear-powered bomber was reported to be flying uh, from the Moscow area, and this has been independently reported by other sources. Uh, the interesting thing about this was that the article claimed that this was not just a test bed for flying a nuclear reactor round in, but it was actually a nuclear-powered bomber, uh, and this really put the Americans on their toes. America was already reeling from the news that the Soviets had launched the first satellite into orbit, Sputnik. It looked like the Russians were ahead technologically. Well, Sputnik in America was an extreme, was a negative surprise because here is a high-tech high -tech accomplishment by these backward communist Russians. And so something, the only way that could happen is I'm quoting now, is that something is wrong. You know, something's wrong in America that has to be fixed. And the people who cause this to be wrong are people like Eisenhower who, you know, are not sufficiently imaginative about deal when they deal with these great ideas. And it's got to be fixed. So, so there was tremendous pressure on the government and within the government to just do project after project after project, all in response to Sputnik. I mean, we were going to respond to Sputnik in a hundred ways. One such way was to revive the flagging U.S. atom-powered plane project. A campaign was now launched by the Air Force and sympathetic politicians to revive the WS-125. There really were passions connected to this nuclear airplane. And one of them was a the Democrat from a labor district in Pennsylvania named Dan Flood. And he, you know, he had, he had this article in Aviation Week with this picture. You guys are asleep at the switch again, you know. Representative Melvin Price, chairman of the Joint Congressional Atomic Energy Subcommittee, actually declared that the Russians were now three to five years ahead of the Americans in terms of nuclear aircraft propulsion and declared that the Americans ought to really do something and step up their efforts to get even. I remember one classified meeting we had with the, one of the military appropriations committees the, of the House of Representatives about this Aviation Week article. You know, why aren't you guys doing so? Don't you understand how important this is? But I knew enough about the Soviet, the level of Soviet technology to not take it seriously. I mean, I knew how hard it was to do. And uh, I didn't think they could, I, I didn't think we could do it. I certainly didn't think they could. In fact, Russia had been working in secret on a range of nuclear powered aircraft for many years. It was one really wild project they had in the early 50s for a flying boat that weighed a thousand tons. But the real emphasis of the Soviet military was to uh, keep pace with the Americans and build their own version of a nuclear powered bomber. The Soviets already had a long range strategic bomber. In the West, it was known under its NATO codename, the Bear. 
but the bear was too slow to penetrate America's new missile and fighter defenses. Now it appeared Russia was developing a nuclear-powered alternative. It was called the M50. Its NATO codename was Bounder. But how could the Soviets have overtaken America in nuclear-powered planes? The Soviet researchers into nuclear-powered aircraft paralleled the American ones. They had the same problems to confront. Uh, the weight of the reactor, the shielding, and they came up with much the same kind of solutions. The, the, the Russians went down the distributed shielding route as well. Uh, curiously, uh, the, the Soviet figures for the weight and size uh, of the reactor they wanted to fly with uh, is very similar to what the Americans came up with, about 80 tons. News of the Soviet atom plane success allied to the successful launch of Sputnik, now changed US policy. The AEC, the Defense Department, or several Defense Department officials, and the Air Force then threw their weight behind uh, an effort to get the program uh, back up to the prestige level and the amount of input that it had before, and, and tried to urge the president to back it so that the Americans could have a plane flying by the early 60s. President Eisenhower now increased the budget for America's atom plane project. But Eisenhower remained suspicious. He put the accelerated program under management he could trust. By that time, I had already developed a very substantial doubts about its, about its practicality. The goal is a reasonable goal. I mean, an airplane with an indefinite flight time. But uh, the practicality, and I could summarize it in three different areas, all of which are closely related. One is that airplanes are subject to crashing. The idea of flying around with a reactor, which sadly might crash anywhere, is just not something which could be made acceptable. The second point is, that especially on the direct uh, uh, drive, or the, the direct uh, reactor, direct heat, it was inevitable that it would constantly be spewing radioactivity out the tail. And the, and the other one was the pilots. I mean, the question of shielding the pilots was a serious one. Herb York was a good scientist who knew that they hadn't cracked the four major problems they still hadn't built an engine that was powerful enough to get the whole shooting match off the ground. They still hadn't solved the major shielding problems. The direct cycle engine was still too dirty to be considered, and the indirect cycle, the technology was simply too immature. Backed by Eisenhower, York imposed new goals on the project. He cancelled further development of the airframe as being premature. Work would concentrate on getting a foolproof engine working. Progress was happening on the engine front. General Electric ran a series of very successful experiments using the direct cycle concept. The engine was running routinely, solely under nuclear power. The General Electric Company uh, were eventually able to get their direct cycle engine working routinely. Uh, so the concept was proved. Uh, the trouble was they still couldn't crack the weight problem plane and the engine still couldn't get off the ground. While General Electric was working on their direct cycle atomic jet engine, Pratt & Whitney was still working on the indirect cycle. Dr. York thought the indirect cycle approach, which offered the prospect of fewer dangerous leaks of radiation, was the best prospect for a working engine. However, even with all this renewed vigour in, in terms of engine research, even by 1959, real progress had been very slow and a working prototype was not even in sight. In 1960, the political picture changed again. John F. Kennedy was elected President of the United States, beating Eisenhower's Vice President Richard Nixon. Kennedy had accused the Republican Eisenhower administration of allowing the Soviet Union to overtake America in technology and military strength. Was Kennedy going to restart the WS-125 project? During the presidential election campaign, Kennedy blamed Eisenhower for allowing America to fall behind Russia in military terms. He blamed 
Eisenhower for, for what he called the missile gap, that Russia had more ballistic missiles than America, and also for the bomber gap. But on taking office, Kennedy would discover Eisenhower's last secret. In the closing months of his presidency, Eisenhower had come into classified intelligence about the true state of Soviet military preparations. The new U-2 spy plane and the first space-based reconnaissance satellites had revealed the actual state of Soviet bomber and missile forces. When Kennedy arrived in the White House, he was in for a major shock. There was no bomber gap. Indeed, it seemed that the Russians had hardly any bombers operational at all. There was no missile gap, and worse still, it appeared they didn't have an atom-powered plane. It seemed that there never had been an atom-powered plane. The entire Aviation Week story about the Soviets flying a nuclear-powered plane had been a hoax. There never was a nuclear-powered aircraft. There, there was a Bounder. They built one single aircraft, the M50 Bounder. Uh, but it was powered by ordinary jet engines and it wasn't a very efficient aircraft. This knowledge now doomed the American atomic bomber project and any prospects of a revival of the WS-125. All that remained when he became president was, the, was research and development on the indirect drive, the, the, the liquid metal drive, and even that, there was no, there was, we're no longer talking about an airplane. So when Kennedy became president, the program was 95% gone. The atomic bomber was finally cancelled in March 1961, only a month after Kennedy entered the White House. The surprising thing is that just at the moment Kennedy was cancelling uh, the ANP program, they were beginning to make breakthroughs in reactor materials that would lead eventually to uh, lightweight reactors, particularly um, that could be used in spaceflight. Today, if you were trying to build a, a, a nuclear uh, powered engine for an aircraft, you could probably do so given the technology we now have. The atom powered plane had been overtaken by events. The US Navy's nuclear powered Polaris submarines were becoming operational and America now had reliable and accurate long-range ballistic missiles. The manned bomber, no matter how powered, had become vulnerable to the anti-aircraft missile. America's flirtation with atom-powered flight was over. But the story of the nuclear-powered bomber had one last secret to give up, the very biggest of all. In the early 1990s, it was revealed that the Soviet Union had flown an atomic-powered aircraft as early as 1961. Everyone was dumbstruck after the fall of the Iron Curtain to discover that, after all, the Russians had flown a nuclear-powered aircraft. They flew it 40 times, but this was in the 1960s, uh, and they did it by simply not shielding the crew. Khrushchev was so concerned by what he perceived to be American progress in building an atomic-powered uh, bomber that he demanded one of his own. And the truth of the matter was that the Russians were playing catch-up. They built a fairly crude uh, direct cycle um, engine and with fairly basic shielding that not only irradiated the crew but also passed all kinds of contaminated air into the environment as it flew. The Russians chose the Bear as their test plane. It was powered by two conventional turboprop engines, but it also had two experimental direct cycle jet engines. These were powered by a reactor installed in the main fuselage. Some 40 nuclear powered flights were conducted between 1961 and 1969, with test pilot E.A. Gurionov at the controls. I actually have a letter from test pilot Gurionov. He writes, we had all been irradiated, but we ignored it. Of the two crews, only three men survived, a young navigator, a military navigator, and me. The first to go, a young technician, took only three years to die. The problem of shielding the crew from radiation in a nuclear-powered aircraft has never really been solved. But the underlying ideas behind the NB-36 project continue to influence American military research. In 
whenever you spend money on high tech, there's always there's always the possibility and usually the reality of of some useful fallout. In April 1961, the month after Kennedy cancelled the manned nuclear-powered bomber program, a contract was awarded to the Chance Vought Aircraft Company to build an atom-powered cruise missile. With no crew involved, it would not require heavy shielding. The new weapon was to be a direct-cycle nuclear ramjet. Just as I was leaving the directorship at Livermore, we took on the responsibility for the reactor design for the nuclear cruise missile. The cruise missile is just a pilotless airplane. You got this direct drive engine. It's just like it's very it's you know a lot of parallels between it and a nuclear airplane, except since it didn't have a pilot, the shielding problem was not the same. The new missile was called SLAM. Chance Fort got as far as building a one-third prototype of the SLAM. The final design for the SLAM would be a missile that was 65 foot long. It would be fired up to high altitude to, uh, to get as far as it needed to go. It was indeed a, a missile that would have infinite range being nuclear powered. But then it would drop down to 100 feet and be going at Mach 3. So this thing was absolutely unstoppable. As well as releasing nuclear bombs, the Livermore scientists considered using the reactor itself as a lethal nuclear device which could irradiate enemy territory. It was the ultimate doomsday weapon. You run it close to the ground, it fries everything. I mean, on top of everything. So there the radiation was an advantage rather than a disadvantage. By 1964, SLAM was ready for flight testing. But politics was again to intervene. Kennedy and Khrushchev faced one another over Cuba, and the world came close to nuclear annihilation. In the aftermath, Kennedy and Khrushchev signed a nuclear test ban treaty. I think the death knell of the nuclear-powered aircraft and the nuclear-powered missile came uh, with John Kennedy. He was looking towards uh, an accommodation with the Soviets. Uh, to have gone into that kind of nuclear technology would have been uh, a provocation. Uh, and after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the general public knew how close they'd come to nuclear war. The SLAM program was terminated in 1964, but the onboard guidance system developed for SLAM was later utilized in the conventional cruise missiles that are part of today's arsenal of US weapons. In the end, the nuclear-powered aircraft was killed by simpler, cheaper technology. I mean, even in-flight refueling, which is routine these days, uh, robbed it of the advantage of being able to fly forever. Uh, and the ballistic missile, uh, which can hit a target on a postage stamp, or the cruise missile with its accuracy, uh, that did away with the need for the big bomber. But the dream of nuclear flight may not be over. In 2003, it was revealed that the United States Air Force Research Laboratory had funded two studies on nuclear-powered versions of the Northrop Grumman Global Hawk. The Global Hawk is an unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV. Its principal role is as a long-range, high-altitude reconnaissance platform. It is designed to fly from the United States to any hot spot on the Earth, and then circle for days at a time, sending data back to base. The plan now is to give the Global Hawk a flight endurance of several months. Has the technology that created the NB-36 at last come of age? Will the day come when nuclear-powered UAVs cruise the skies for months or years on end? This was the dream behind the original atomic bomber, the WS-125. One of the planes that never flew. <laughs>
indefinitely. This would be America's principal weapon in any future world war. In military terms, and uh, setting it in, in the right historical context, this was a great idea because what it meant was that you could build a bomber that was not constrained by the amount of fuel it carried. So you could have a nuclear bomber, nuclear powered, carrying nuclear weapons, airborne, all the time, watching and waiting for the enemy. But LeMay and the Air Force were not trusted by someone in high office, President Harry Truman. President Truman was very worried about leaving this awesome power of the atom solely in the hands of the military. So he created a civilian body, the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC, uh, responsible directly to himself and the office of the president. And this would control all nuclear research, it would control the nuclear reactors, and, and this really annoyed the generals, it would keep under lock and key the atomic bombs. The Atomic Energy Commission identified a series of uses for an atom-powered aircraft. First, as a long-range bomber, Power from a nuclear reactor would theoretically allow an aircraft to fly for months without refueling, using only tiny amounts of uranium. Another possibility was the flying boat. The Atomic Energy Commission's pet team of academics at MIT thought that one of the prime candidates for a nuclear-powered aircraft was a passenger flying boat. Uh, in those days, Air traffic was still very underdeveloped. There weren't that many big airfields could take passenger planes. So flying port to port was quite a good idea. And also, an atomic reactor in an aircraft was quite heavy, and a flying boat was big enough to carry it. So that looked like a good bet. Indeed, before the age of the jet, the flying boat seemed the most promising aircraft for long-haul civil aviation. The design also allowed for more passengers to be carried in a greater degree of comfort. Millionaire Howard Hughes built the Spruce Goose to carry passengers across the Atlantic non-stop. And in England, Saunders Row were building the elegant Princess flying boat. It was intended for the growing transatlantic market. They were developing a docking system uh, in fact, that was in use at Southampton, so you no longer were taken out to your flying boat in, in, your, in motorboats. You'd climb, walked aboard it from docks, and there would have been docks at either end, drive the aeroplane in, tie it up, and then walk ashore. The Princess was one of the largest aircraft ever built. Well, it was a double-decker, so we had upper and lower decks. We had provision for cocktail bars and all the rest of it, and double berth cabins. It was definitely going to be an upmarket luxury way of crossing the Atlantic in about seven and a half hours. An atom-powered flying boat might have other uses. Atomic power was also being developed for a new generation of submarines that could lurk for months under the sea. New flying boats with atomic engines would have the range to hunt them down. SEP knew no section housed a 12-ton lead and rubber shielded compartment for the crew of five, pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, and two nuclear engineers. There were also water jackets in the fuselage and behind the crew compartment to absorb radiation from the reactor. After conversion, the aircraft was redesignated the NB-36, the N standing for nuclear. What they did was they took an actual working nuclear reactor and they put it in the aft bomb bay and they flew with it. And the point being, could you protect the crew from the radiation from a working reactor? The whole essence of this experiment was simply to test whether you could fly a nuclear reactor in an aircraft and not kill the crew through radiation while doing it. If you couldn't solve that problem, then it didn't matter whether you could make the engines work, no one would fly it. The first flight of the NB-36 with its atomic reactor was on September the 17th, 1955. The pilots christened their aircraft the Crusader. The tests proved that the radiation could be contained 
provided there was heavy shielding, atomic powered flight was a step closer. But now, another problem had to be resolved. It was all very well flying with a reactor, but what happened if you crashed? Because of this danger, the Air Force took very special precautions. Flying beside the NB-36 on every mission was an Air Force transport plane carrying a platoon of Marines. The plan was that if ever the NB-36 crashed, the Marines in the accompanying aircraft would instantly parachute out, seal off the crash site from uh, prying eyes, uh, and obviously to protect uh, any, any nosy civilians. Uh, that could have been quite dangerous, and, and the Marines being the Marines, they nicknamed the, this, this unit the glow-in-the-dark brigade. Between 1955 and 1957, the NB-36 made 47 successful flights. The problem now was to get an actual working aircraft into the air. And the division of labor was that the Air Force would provide the airframe, and the Atomic Energy Commission would provide the working engine. The planned propulsion system would weigh 80 tons. The whole nuclear engine unit, including the reactor, was to be built as a single module and removable for refueling and repair. The challenge now was to get an atom-powered engine to work in flight. An ordinary jet engine works by sucking in air through an intake and compressing it. This means that more of the oxygen required to burn the fuel is squeezed into the combustion chamber. The aviation fuel then burns with the oxygen, causing continuous rapid heating of the air. This heated air expands rapidly, creating thrust to propel the aircraft forward. A jet engine can attain great speed. However, there is a drawback. A fast jet engine is fuel hungry, yet the aircraft can carry only so much aviation fuel. July the 16th, 1945, Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. The atomic age is born. This is the story of one forgotten child of the early optimistic days of atomic power. How, before the space race of the 1960s, America and Russia poured billions into another technological contest. The building of a giant nuclear-powered aircraft. A plane so fantastic it could stay aloft for months at a time. Free of earthbound and vulnerable bases, it was the ultimate doomsday machine. Today, atomic energy is mistrusted, even feared. But for a time, just after World War II, things were different. The American public was gripped by a happy nucleomania. There would soon be electricity too cheap to meter. There would be atomic-powered cars, trains, helicopters, and cargo ships. Well, the public perception about nuclear power uh right after the war and uh, for probably 20 years thereafter, was very positive. People talked about it coming very soon, and they talked about power too cheap to meter and other, other optimistic remarks like that. Some people talked about using it everywhere, you know, for transportation of all kinds. There was even a scheme, I mean, totally mad from today's perspective, to detonate atomic bombs over the North and South Pole to melt the ice, give the world a warmer climate. And there would be atomic-powered airplanes. As early as 1942, Enrico Fermi and his associates on the Manhattan Project, which built the first atom bomb, had discussed the prospective use of atomic power to propel aircraft. The great advantage nuclear power could give a plane was an almost limitless range. In 1950, in-flight refueling had not yet been perfected, 
although experiments by the British in the interwar years had shown that the technology to transfer fuel between two planes in flight was easy enough to perfect. But in the pre-jet age, carrying aloft a worthwhile load of gasoline to transfer to another aircraft meant the project was impractical. Now, the British had actually done some uh, limited experiments in, in, in flight refueling before the war, but what they'd found was that you could not transfer significant amount of fuel to make a, a real difference in the range. World War II was fought without in-flight refueling. US B-17s and B-24s operating over Germany were massacred because fighter escorts, with their short range, could not fly with them. Only when fighters like the Mustang became available, specially equipped with long-range fuel tanks, could daylight bombing raids be carried out over Nazi Germany without huge losses. The operating range of aircraft was a major and continuing concern to the American military. In 1937, the Army Air Corps commissioned the Lockheed P-38 Lightning as a long-range fighter interceptor to operate mainly over the Pacific. When it entered service in 1941, the P-38 had a range of 700 kilometers. America had to fight wars like no one else. They had to fight over the Pacific. That meant it needed aircraft with immense range. They also had to fly safely. A single engine fighter was at risk. If the engine stopped, the plane went down into the sea. You needed two engines. So that meant an airplane, fast, safe, twin-engined, that was the P-38. In 1944, the Army Air Force introduced the B-29 Superfortress, an aircraft with a range of four and a half thousand kilometers, capable of bombing Japan from island bases in the Central Pacific. World War II also saw the development of technology which would solve some of the problems that had hindered American pre-war civil aviation. Bigger and more efficient engines and airframes would allow civil airliners, for the first time, to traverse the oceans without stopping to refuel. All these developments seemed to usher in a new age of opportunity in which everything was possible. Yet these developments were dwarfed by an entirely new set of problems and challenges. The Cold War, although only just beginning, was set to dominate American strategic thinking for decades to come. America needed a bomber to reach targets deep inside Soviet Russia, a bomber with a range of tens of thousands of kilometers. The answer lay with a radical new kind of engine. In 1946, under the leadership of General Curtis LeMay, the United States Air Force set up a program called NEPA, which stands for the N Nuclear Energy Propulsion of Aircraft. This was to oversee the possibilities of designing and building a bomber that would be a nuclear-powered bomber. Just as the P-38 and the B-29 had provided the means with which to confront Japan in the Pacific, a nuclear-powered bomber seemed to be the ideal aircraft for any future conflict with Russia. The number one advantage, and really any other advantages derived from it, was the fact that they imagined that the flight duration could be greatly extended, almost indefinitely. Within a year, design work had begun on one of the most awesome weapons platforms ever proposed, an atomic bomber. In 1948, the head of the newly created Strategic Air Command was General Curtis E. LeMay. He had commanded the B-29 offensive against Japan in the Pacific. LeMay had a reputation as a confrontationist, what we might today call a hawk. Well, he was a general who really didn't particularly care for civilians. <laughs> he was a fighting general from World War II. He had commanded uh, bombing attacks in both Europe and in Japan. So he was a World War general with the kind of attitudes you would expect in a successful general from that period. Now, LeMay sought the ultimate bomber to counter the new Soviet threat, one powered by nuclear engines and capable of remaining timber, 1949. A lone US B-29 reconnaissance bomber picks up samples of radioactive material 
high above the Soviet Union. Russia had joined the nuclear club. The next year, North Korea invaded South Korea. The Cold War had turned hot. These events were to accelerate the plan for an American atom-powered bomber. The Congressional Joint Committee on Atomic Energy was very, was very much in favor of going ahead with promoting and going ahead with the nuclear bomber. The Atomic Energy Commission itself also was. They, they developed eventually a special subdivision which did that work. And uh, within the Department of Defense, the Department of the Air Force, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of great hopes for the nuclear airplane. In 1951, the Atomic Energy Commission ordered into production the world's first experimental nuclear-powered aircraft. The designated aim, uh, as stated in 1951, was to produce two flying test beds, so two flying nuclear-powered aircraft by 1957. And the program started with a series of testing the shielding requirements for the crew. The major issue was how to protect the pilot and crew from the effects of radiation coming from the reactor. One solution that was seriously canvassed uh, was only using older crew to fly the aircraft. The theory being that uh, they would be irradiated to some degree anyway, uh, but if they were beyond child-rearing age, uh, then um, it wouldn't matter so much. You, you had to use all these tricks, like base it on un uninhabited islands and things like that. Use old men for the pilots so that so that the effect of radiation on the gene on you know on the on the sperm would not get into children. They were going to have, have pilots. They called them the Nipa man. To gain experience in dealing with radiation shielding, it was decided to build a flying reactor before the atomic engines were ready. Well, they were talking about special aircraft because nobody knew how much it was going to weigh, but it looked like it was going to weigh an awful lot. So the U.S. Air Force turned to its biggest aircraft, the mighty Convair B-36 bomber. The B-36 was the largest American bomber ever built. It had a wingspan of 70 meters and a range of 13,000 kilometers. At first, the B-36 was powered by six conventional propeller engines. But later versions saw the addition of four jet engines for greater speed and load carrying, giving rise to the phrase, six turning, four burning. Aircrew called it the aluminium overcoat. The B-36, for the first time, gave the American Air Force the capacity of what we now call global reach, global power. That is, that you can reach anywhere in the world with a bomber and influence events there through bombing them. In 1953, an ordinary B-36 bomber was selected as a test bed for the atomic bomber program. It was modified to carry a small reactor in the aft bomb bay. The reactor was not connected to the engines, 